Uh, so thank you for joining me. My name's uh, Bill Giard. Uh, I work at Intel, so I've been uh, at Intel for 20 years, currently lead our architecture and, and enterprise strategy within the data center group. Uh, prior to joining DCG, um, my focus was um, on uh, leading our enterprise strategy in IT, our app and software development efforts uh, for most of my career at Intel. So today I want to share with you some research that we've done, our own experiences, what we've talked about with our customers around you know, setting cloud strategies and how uh, you know, organizations can look at their application portfolio environment and understand what works best on premises and a private cloud, uh, potentially a public cloud, and navigating kind of that journey. Um, so you know, before we get started, we'll set some context around really, really what are the focus areas that an enterprise organization is, is dealing with, not only cloud um, itself as an opportunity, but, but certainly responding to ever-increasing cyber threats and security um, uh, concerns that are driving application code changes, causing uh, new infrastructure controls, uh, you know, driving you know, new opportunities for um, speeding development with DevOps initiatives. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. It's, it's getting more formalized with um, driving you know, more continuous deployment and continuous integration, um, taking advantage of uh, open standards and, and software platforms, um, you know, driving you know, new shifts. It used to be um, in, in IT that if you standardize on a common operating system and platform that you could speed your deployment. Um, you know, that's you know, kind of taking a, a converse effect where you know, rapid uh, deployments of new operating systems and browsers on a quarterly basis is really causing organizations to make pretty significant code changes to their uh, software environment. Certainly the, the scale of computing is growing. Uh, used to be uh, you know, in, in IT that you know, uh, if you had a software solution that was uh, you know, higher functionality at lower cost, that would win the RFP. Uh, we've seen you know, quite dramatically, certainly in our own environment, that our users will actually pay for more uh, for software solutions if the experience is good and it's doing the right things right. Um, and so that's causing you know, a whole disruption in, in the way that we're doing uh, purchasing of procurement of solutions. Analytics is growing, you know, certainly IoT and social. Um, the net net of really that whole macro uh, environment really is you know, a cloud strategy should you know, be in support of the broader business objectives. Uh, we've seen a lot of organizations you know, pursue cloud for the sake of cloud. Um, and those end up struggling a bit, but you know, cloud uh, as an uh, enabler for you know, digital transformation, an enabler uh, for responding to some of these really is the solution that works best. So um, you know, the key message on this one is don't pursue cloud you know, for the sake of cloud. Um, it certainly is a key enabler. We'll show some data points on our own experiences, but you know, really approach your cloud strategies um, as a key component for enabling these other uh, business objectives. Um, so, you know, Organizations are pursuing cloud, it's no surprise. And they're doing it again in three areas, um, you know, really to address challenges and what we've seen before. Um, certainly business agility, um, you know, how do we improve time to market? How do we respond to the rapid changing environment, um, develop and deploy new capabilities, um, get faster return on the investment, uh, respond uh, more quickly to uh, user needs. Lower cost, um, you know, cost was the driver uh, historically for, you know, pursuing a cloud journey. Um, it's really fallen over the last few years, in the last few surveys. It used to be number one three years ago, hey, I'm pursuing cloud technologies for cost. Cost is still super important. Um, it really is starting to take a second seat to the agility and growth area. Um, but you know, cost really is an important consideration in almost every entry conversation. Um, not only cost for the infrastructure, but also for the team that's managing the environment. Um, and security and trust. You know, how do we um, really drive new solutions and respond to the changing needs? Um, so, you know, organizations are pursuing cloud, they're pursuing it in, in response to kind of the industry trends that are driving uh, their solutions and then really, you know, setting, uh, you know, a, a plan for, you know, improving agility, lowering cost, and then, uh, you know, really comprehending their security needs. So, you know, really, um, where that's evolved, oops. What happened to our presentation here? So I, while they bring that back up, so, so really the um, you know, strategy was one where, um, oh, that's better, okay. So um, 
you know, it used to be, you know, a pr private public cloud, and so hybrid cloud um, really is kind of the, where things are migrating. You start to see, you know, not only, um, you know, solutions and, and traditional capabilities with things like, you know, VMware and OpenStack integrating with, with things like Amazon and Google. Um, at, you know, Microsoft is uh, embracing, you know, Azure plus Azure Stack. And so really it's a, a decision of not, you know, public or private, but how, what's finding the right mix. Um, so we've done, you know, a number of research uh, efforts over the last, um, you know, year, year and a half, where we went out and talked to a bunch of users, um, you know, took our own experience, worked with our analyst, um, you know, over 125 different, um, you know, uh, focus sessions and a lot of research efforts around, you know, what are the key characteristics. So we want to share with you at least, you know, some of those key findings, some of the key tenets, um, some key learnings around that um, to help navigate that um, environment. <clears throat> you know, certainly, um, people are pursuing uh, private cloud, they're pursuing it for different reasons. Uh, most have a multi-cloud strategy, so when we talk hybrid cloud, really talk private plus public, um, and then even a multi-cloud strategy that says, hey, we're running both, uh, you know, perhaps multiple um, public solutions, certainly in a SaaS world, that's true. Uh, you know, where we have, you know, whether it's your, um, you know, CRM solution, your um, email solution, or doc collaboration, really running those in multiple environments becomes uh, critical. Um, and they're doing that for the, the challenge that we talked about before, reducing uh, time to market, lowering cost, you know, improved scalability, um, higher developer satisfaction. We'll, we'll have a deeper discussion in a few uh, you know, slides around, hey, what's the role of the application line of business in those cloud strategies? Um, it's, it's disrupted quite a bit from you know, what's the traditional environment. And then improved infrastructure management. But it gets you to, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, there's the business context for cloud and how do you set an uh, environment and strategy. Is it public, is it private, is it a mix of both? Um, so what we want to do now is kind of share, you know, with you at least, you know, our observations, what we've set from a, a cloud strategy, what we've seen from our research. Um, there is more details on this uh, on intel.com. You'll be able to see, you know, some of the research itself. It's published out there. Um, but there's really three areas um, that become in, you know, key considerations. Certainly, the business environment, um, you, know, you know, what's the environment with respect to a local organization. Um, some key technical considerations that came up pretty consistently um, around performance, integration, you know, the size of the data, level of security and control, um, and then other elements around um, ecosystem. Um, so in the next few slides, we'll, we'll share at least the summary of that research. Um, we'll, we'll also um, show you uh, some workload assessments, some application workloads by vertical that says, hey, what are the weighting based off that from an industry perspective to help at least guide you as a starting point? Um, it's certainly, um, you know, a uh, beginning, right, for your own organization um, to be able to pursue. Um, and so the intent really for, is for us to, you know, help you on your cloud journey, uh, you know, at least from an Intel perspective. You know, we run most of the clouds, uh, you know, from an architecture perspective, both public and private. And so our goal really is to help, you know, our customers and our partners, you know, uh, drive solutions that help them grow their business. That's where we think, you know, we win. That's where we think the organizations win. Um, and so we really are, um, you know, in the, in the mode of trying to help uh, really pursue the optimal strategy such that you can, you know, avoid the costly uh, rework from moving to one environment or, or struggling and then moving it back. Uh, and we've seen that. So really, that's really our own uh, purpose on, on why we do that, and we think um, it's a good uh, effort. It is our number one question we often get from our, our customers and our partners, where do I run my solution? Um, how do we do that? And so, you know, the intent of this uh, discussion really is to help you understand, uh, you know, what we've learned, what our, our partners have told us, the experiences that we've had. Um, so business, you know, certainly the first part, you know, why we often like to get into, um, you know, kind of the technical consideration, certainly, um, you know, within our own uh, IT organization, the starting point uh, really centers on, hey, what's the business objective that your organization is pursuing? Um, you know, are you trying to improve agility? Uh, you know, you've got a, you know, imperative to respond to some, you know, digital disruption in your own environment. Um, you know, you know, and it may vary around, hey, I've got a, you know, existing infrastructure that I've got to go manage. Um, I've got some legal cost controls um, that I've got to go pursue. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a new business opportunity, remote geography that I don't have a, a data center involved in, right? Um, and so really spinning up and responding to those. Or even just managing high levels of service level agreement. 
and, and those kind of considerations vary between uh, public and private. So certainly in an agility perspective, if you're um, you know, looking to rapidly deploy some new capabilities that your organization may not have the um, technical expertise to support or heavyweight from a, a capital investment, you know, uh, the uh, public cloud becomes a, a pretty good offering uh, that says, hey, how do I jumpstart that? I may you know, get some key learnings, make, make sure it works, and then move it back. Um, but you know, the, the converse is also true, right? So, so you've got some agility and I've got you know, a new imperative to release some of the solutions, respond to a security uh, control, and I've got a pretty significant level of investment already. And you know, lifting that and moving it, you know, working through the integrations between the firewall becomes you know, quite expensive. Um, and so it all depends on what you're trying to do from a, a new uh, investment perspective from an agility. What do you have to integrate? What do you have to go deploy? Are you lifting and shifting and those types of things? Um, and so, you know, looking at, you know, really what the business objective from a, a cost agility perspective um, and where you're at and where you need to go to becomes important. Um, the number one uh, kind of consideration um, that we hear um, oftentimes is really around, you know, compliance, uh, legal and control compliance. And being able to manage that, you know, get the transparency and control from a uh, infrastructure perspective, highly regulated data sovereignty, um, and driving some of the you know legal compliance um, that varies. And so, you know, if it's a solution that may not have a whole lot of regulatory oversight, then public cloud becomes you know kind of a, a an area that most organizations pursue. Not to say you can't put those controls in; they're actually working quite hard to drive security controls and do security compliance. Um, and and so, it certainly is um, you know one that um, is also. I mean, you know, quite feasible, um, but your solutions have to be aware around, um, you know, what are your legal compliance controls that you can move. Um, oftentimes, organizations are pursuing a private cloud for that very reason because they're, it's not just that the ability of, a, of an infrastructure to manage the legal compliance, but the ability to do attestation and prove to your auditors uh, that, you know, the controls and, and com uh, components that you're running, um, you know, are supporting the business. And so really looking at it not just from a, you know, security perspective, but what's your ability to, you know, prove that your uh, process controls are in place. Um, global reach, um, I mentioned uh, before that, you know, it may be a consideration that you're, you're branching out, you don't have a data center in Europe. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, uh, making sure that you're spending your dollars on, you know, growing uh, in the business solutions versus, you know, building facilities may make sense. Uh, you know, if you have a design team or you have a, you know, audience uh, globally or you're getting, you know, cost and, and capacity, um, you know, we certainly uh, see many organizations pursuing some of that from a volume perspective. Um, so that also becomes a, a key business consideration is what's the strategy for deploying solutions where your end user is growing, um, you know, and where does that kind of run? And then, you know, service level agreements. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon. It used to be, hey, you know, we, we can't move something to the public cloud because we need, you know, certain levels of uh, operating SLAs and operating level agreements, OLAs. Um, we've seen that shift uh, change quite dramatically as, um, you know, the kind of robust fault tolerance things happen in the public cloud, but we certainly have, you know, quality levels of service guaranteed service delivery, um, you know, depending on the criticality of the business that still, you know, needs some of those um, strong SLAs, um, that's really where we may uh, see deployments really in the, in the private cloud more specifically um, than, a, than a public environment. <clears throat> now, it's situational, but it really starts at the business context. Are you trying to grow your business? Are you trying to achieve cost? And you know, really, what are the you know, first key uh, you know, sets of business considerations? Um, the next one, really, you know, we, we found four key technical attributes. And you know, at Intel, we kind of hone on these qu quite heavily uh, because we want to make sure our, our products and platforms are optimized to be able to support you know, the performance needs, the security needs, what we have from integration and, and size. Um, and so, you know, you know, we look at this and, and there's really four key attributes that came up pretty consistently. I mentioned the first one, you know, you know as organizations are mapping out um, their, their strategy, you know, what are the, the four technical characteristics of, of an application, um, you know, or workload environment that, that drives that. So security became number one, uh, you know, quite strong. Um, around, hey, you know, how do we um, drive really the security and legal and transparency controls that you need to do from an IP protection or even a, a geo-regulatory control perspective? Um, you know, performance, and it's not only performance with respect to the application or, or solution itself running on a, a series of servers, but also performance in relation to the end user. Uh, so if you have a manufacturing or, or partner systems, manufacturing environment that just got to process, uh, you, know, uh, you know, data from your factory line, you know, be able to do some insights and then load new components, you know, that latency 
um, that you have in that area becomes important. But also, you know, if you've got a set of users working on large sets of, of CAD design files, and that becomes important as well. Um, and so really, not only the performance of the system itself on how fast it can respond and get a fairly tuned environment, but performance with respect to um, you know, other systems or other integration systems or, or um, the end users using the, the solution. Um, integration, um, almost no enterprise application actually is standalone, right? So, you know, the level of uh, integration from something like an ERP environment becomes an important consideration. Do you lift it, move it through the firewall? What's the level of rework? Um, you know, there's almost no enterprise app um, that is truly standalone. I mean, you have some of those, um, but the level of rework and the level of integration to other systems um, becomes important. Um, and then, you know, certainly the size of the data. We've seen, you know, uh, you know a bunch of work around, um, you know, a, as data grows, uh, being able to just move it um, from your, you know, local um, system to the um, external solution um, becomes uh, expensive from a time perspective, but then also managing that externally is also an important consideration. And so on this one, there's some examples around, hey, um, you know, there's some uh, application workloads uh, that are, you know, really um, have, you know, less stringent performance, low latency, um, you know, end user responsive needs. They're designed from the get-go to kind of work over, a, you know, a wide area network or over the internet. Um, you know, they have, you know, uh, burst capacity from a performance perspective where they may need a lot of, you know, compute capacity. Um, you know, that you may not have the, the flow, and so really that becomes a good opportunity for a public, you know, burst capacity if you don't have the scale, um, you know, where you may see some, you know, lower latency ones kind of running on a private cloud. Um, you know, security, you know, it varies, like I said, it's kind of the number one area that we see in a number of cases. Um, uh, and really it all becomes around, you know, what's the attack surface you want to um, have? What's the level of rework and controls that you have? So, you know, a, a private cloud has a smaller attack surface than uh, a public cloud, but you may not have the operational controls in your own organization. So how do you go put those in place? And so looking at those different considerations. Um, and then, you know, optimized integration and then, uh, you know, things for data size. And so, you know, really, you know, those are the four key technical characteristics. And, you know, at Intel, we're looking at, you know, how do we provide, you know, high-speed fabric for performance? How do we do, um, you know, implement, you know, uh, cloud um, security controls for app isolation and VM isolation? And what are we doing for uh, encryption capabilities for security, optimizing communication APIs from an integration perspective? And then, you know, certainly um, storage is a big focus, certainly with our, our uh, platform capabilities with, um, 3D cross point and our NAND storage and what we're doing in, in Optane technology. And so we get different things that we look at, you know, how do we optimize both public and private cloud in each one of those areas. And so you'll see those, um, not in this session, but, you know, kind of a deeper discussion around, hey, you know, how do we take this in our own perspective and help our customers and you just drive that. So, so then we look at, you know, kind of a, a standard set of workloads, right? Um, we say, hey, you know, uh, what do we have from, you know, things that may run, you know, more effectively um, on-premise or public? And it's no um, kind of surprise that, um, you know, some of the more mature um, software, you know, commercially available software solutions, which you have for, you know, web servers and email, um, or even, you know, some of the customer relationship management systems, you know, really exhibit, you know, lower sets of uh, 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 capabilities from a, you know, size of the data that it's running, level of security and backend integration. Um, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, if you have, you know, some financial systems or research and, and R&D uh, capabilities, they end up seeing, you know, large sets of uh, uh, data size, right? You know, large, uh, you know, security requirements. Um, and then, you know, conversely, there's, you know, fewer commercially available software apps for that. Um, and so, you know, the middle ground is, you know, kind of situational. You certainly see ERP, you know, mix from um, traditional, you know, big deployments on-premise. Um, some of the newer small and medium business have less integration, so they've been able to kind of start in a public cloud environment and it kind of mixes. Um, and this ends up being, you know, a fairly common, you know, set of assessment that says, hey, you know, how do you pursue based off, you know, app and workloads, things that may run off-premise, things that may run on-premise, uh, you know, in a, um, you know, public or, or private cloud environment. Um, and so, you know, you can look at that as kind of a, a framework for running. 
Um, and then there's the ecosystem consideration. We kind of mentioned, you know, really IT organizations are, are really pursuing um, SaaS, public cloud as the new buy, right? The new buy for software, buy versus build. And so the maturity of offerings really becomes, you know, largely the starting point for a conversation. Can I, you know, move my, um, ex you know, uh, email environment or, or purchase my new software solution? And that's really the new way of delivering. And um, we are seeing a hybrid set of, of cloud solutions kind of deploying both you know, um, you know, managed services on premises, but uh, you know, really looking at the SaaS maturity, what's the capability from a developer services offering uh, within a public cloud solution, and what's the ability to kind of respond to you know different ecosystem needs? Um, what's the skill set of my organization, et cetera? And so those kind of all manage into uh, you know different flows of uh, you know where do you map out the key ecosystem? Um, and there's more detail kind of in, in uh, the research paper around some of those, but I want to give you some examples of how we've applied some of that knowledge, how we've navigated, what are some of the best practices that we've had, at least in our own experiences. Um, and so I'll get into, you know, a couple of examples, um, you know, around, you know, defining our own cloud strategy. So we'll look at really, you know, a public cloud uh, SaaS solution, and then we'll look at our uh, more in detail, um, given the focus of, of this summit around, hey, you know, how have we deployed our private cloud capabilities? What have we put onto it? What are the, some of the business results that we've put in? Um, so, so certainly, uh, you know, the first one that, that we'll uh, be open about is, you know, we've been, you know, like any IT organizations, you know, looking at our software portfolio. And we have about 3,000 or so um, applications uh, within Intel that we manage from our IT organization. Um, you know, 6,000 employees, data centers uh, spread globally. But like any organization, we're approaching a strategy from both a, a public cloud and a private um, perspective. And our first one, uh, you know, really is, hey, you know, we, we've got aging software, we've got to respond to um, different changing needs. Um, and so we've got a, you know, portfolio set of, of tools to help manage our, our expense and travel, right? And what do we do from an employee perspective? And so we've, you know, moved that into, you know, a public uh, cloud SaaS offering. Um, and so, you know, really manage that infrastructure. We do have other portfolios that we also kind of look at some of the uh, capabilities from our, our email and collaboration uh, tools. But, the, you know, really the drivers for us was, um, you know, pretty significant cost savings, right? I mean, we've got, um, it's been running a number of years in production. We're able to kind of embrace the mobile worker, right? Be able to, you know, move our traditional browser-based, laptop-based um, solution and be able to deliver uh, capabilities um, via mobile and desktop and, you know, across uh, Mac, uh, Windows, uh, Linux, right, enable our design and our Salesforce and get pretty significant returns in time to market and speed um, from pursuing a SaaS strategy. Um, and, you know, certainly cost is a, a key factor, but also the ability for, um, you know, meeting our end users' expectations uh, uh, as employees, what do we run from that? Um, um, you know, important in that consideration is not only what do we have from a deployment, but also, you know, what's the, the role of the application or line of business in the developer. Um, and so we did another set of research study um, that I'll share that kind of shapes um, the capabilities that we deploy, which really is, um, you know, what's the role of um, the developer in, you know, kind of cloud adoption? Um, how do we, you know, shape that in infrastructure decisions? Um, the short answer is, um, you know, the, the traditional IT infrastructure decision making, the person that would set up your OpenStack environment, uh, isn't necessarily the decision maker that's driving adoption, right? I mean, we saw that in, in some of our, our SaaS solution deployments where the application teams and the um, business really is driving those decisions. And um, when the uh, technology is relatively uh, in its early phases, um, you know, from an app perspective, uh, you know, that the app developer is most influential, right? Um, they're also, that's what uh, Lifecycle says, also in the later phases when you're moving it and you're kind of migrating it and supporting it becomes most influential as well. Um, and important to note is, you know, a lot of the technologies from a, a cloud native perspective, whether it's containers and security, are really in early um, phases of technology maturity. And so what that means is the app developer is, is highly influential in driving your cloud decisions, which, which kind of gets us into you know, approaching a cloud strategy from both an app and an infrastructure perspective. Um, and so we'll talk about um, at least uh, you know, what we've done from our approach, uh, um, you know, integrating both a, a cloud infrastructure, infrastructure service with you know, platform services, which is kind of evolving, right? We have both platform traditional, platform developer services and database services um, to really achieve three things. Agility time to market, all right? We want to be able to enable the developers to release um, code at a pretty rapid pace. Um, 
uh, be able to support their app and, and database line of business, um, you know, drive new efficiencies um, from a, not only an efficiencies from an IT infrastructure cost perspective, but from a deployment as well, and then respond to security uh, concerns. And security is an important one because, you know, we've, you know, been making, you know, at least in, at Intel with our own app software um, strategy, you know, a tremendous amount of code changes to our traditional apps, things that we're running on, you know, .NET or HTML or Java, right? And what are we changing the front end and doing, you know, static code uh, scanning? Um, and so what we found in our security environment is the ability to uh, more quickly patch and standardize some of those on our environment um, pretty significantly improved our security posture uh, for responding to that, uh, you know, those kind of those environments. Um, and so we really have three different uh, cloud offerings internally. Um, we have a, an app platform, which is based off of a, um, you know, a platform as a service, a pass capability. Um, we have a database set of database services that support kind of all of the mainstream databases for SQL Server and Oracle, as well as MySQL and MariaDB. Um, and then a compute environment, which is really largely just uh, VMs, right? So how do we support our VM infrastructure? Uh, important uh, to that consideration really is enabling um, self-service uh, for uh, the development teams, um, not forcing them to go through an IT ticketing process to get uh, you know new virtual machines, uh, making sure that we're kind of holding true to the you know cloud uh, feature sets around you know metering and monitoring and policy enforcement, but but also giving them the you know self service ability to provision an app like they would be able to do in a in a public cloud environment, um, and you know openly that's a big cultural shift debate for our organization. But holding true to the self-service really, you know, rapidly increased our adoption. We have over 2,800 apps or so, um, you know, which is increased from what you'll see on the next slide or so that are deployed to our internal, um, you know, pass environment. Uh, you know, another, uh, you know, 2,200 or so um, apps and databases as well. So we really get rapid adoption uh, from our, our global uh, teams without the mandates that we see in the environment. Um, and really the focus that becomes important is adding things on top of the VM infrastructure becomes pretty critical. Um, you know, most organizations will deploy, you know, like an OpenStack environment and say, hey, you've got, you know, you know free access, self-service access to, you know, compute VMs, got self-service access to um, storage, you can configure the network. And from an app team, you know, it really looks and feels like traditional IT still. Um, and really what they're looking from a cloud perspective is how do I ease the ability to set up my database environment, um, not deploy new sets of app configurations, right? I mean, even if I get a VM with unlimited compute immediately, right, and, and we've got pretty good success stories for moving, you know, the physical server landing down to, you know, um, you know weeks to, you know, hours, right, and then be able to get VMs down to minutes. But even if I get a VM, you know, on instant access, I'm setting up the database environment, setting up the application environment, setting up the app code, still takes weeks in a project, right? And so, you know, how can we also deliver capabilities for our app and dev teams such that they don't have to manage the databases in, in, anymore, they don't have to set up high availability, um, they just deploy their database code. Um, how do we deploy their app code such that the web servers support it? Um, and really, you know, driving um, solutions um, that allow them to focus on, you know, writing code, deploying code, making sure it's tested in integration with um, different DevOps practices or even traditional deployment models, such that they're getting out the environment set up, right? Set up new environments from dev to test and making sure they're um, in place. Containers certainly help with that. And so we're evolving our capabilities to move from the traditional past to kind of a container-based deployment. That's its own set of evolution. It's got its own set of controls in place. But you know, really the key message here is for those new line of uh, decision makers that are driving infrastructure deployment, uh, making sure we're deploying some of those. And so this is um, you know, kind of a, a logical architecture that we've deployed internally, you know, sets of app services. Um, we happen to deploy, um, you know, uh, you know, open source, uh, you know, cloud, uh, uh, you know, platform as a service. Um, this is what it would look like on top of um, OpenStack. Um, we also integrate both sets of automation uh, capabilities around, um, you know, deploying, um, you know, uh, things on top of our, our environment. Um, and the key notion here is abstracting a lot of those things in, you know, traditional uh, past, whether it's, you know, a Cloud Foundry initiative, whether it's OpenShift, uh, what you're doing in Docker Swarm, you know, really, you know, strongly uh, consider, you know, approaching your, your digital transformation uh, and cloud strategy approach by adding some of those things. Um, and this is our own, 
you know, set, right? We've got a, another diagram that talks about, you know, ramping, um, uh, you know, what, what would it mean from a developer ramp? Um, you know, the numbers that I quoted are, are much bigger than what you're seeing here just because, you know, this seems like every time we go and pull the snapshot, um, you know, the adoption gets bigger and bigger. Um, and one of the big debates that we have really is, hey, is it really more cost effective to run, you know, on-premise versus public? And we run both. We've got things in, you know, kind of the, you know, mainstream, uh, you know, top uh, cloud service providers. We've got big, um, you know, SaaS capabilities. And we've been benchmarking um, our own set of uh, cost efficiencies and, and agility time to market on what does it take to, you know, lift and, and replace. Um, internally, it's about six weeks uh, savings to just, you know, reuse things because we don't have to rework. Um, solutions, right? So we can deploy things almost immediately in a, um, you know, DevOps kind of fashion, um, or even traditional deployments, deploying apps and microservices on that solution. But then also just getting the raw cost numbers, right? So we're often asked, hey, um, you know, how are we, you know, taking advantage of some of these private cloud technologies? Um, and so we've been, you know, continuously looking at, um, you know, where, where's the um, public cloud going, you know, what's our cost for deploying into kind of the top uh, cloud service providers and what's our cost for deploying um, infrastructure and supporting these applications um, on premise. Um, and, you know, what we've seen, interestingly enough, is we've continued to kind of drop and optimize. We kind of a normalizing point um, last year, but we're seeing some more savings this year. Um, but, you know, the, the short answer is, you know, within IT, we're wired for getting to the lowest cost right, um, not cost competitive. And so we see some of those kind of uh, level out and we think the market still changes and we're getting new efficiencies now with, with things like serverless computing, um, but this is even just on pure infrastructure as a service savings. Um, so pretty significant savings um, consistently on, on driving, um, you know, our own uh, private cloud versus public. Um, and then additional one from a, a time perspective. Uh, so, you know, what are the stages, right? So, you know, we, we've given some of our own kind of characteristics of, of driving a workload, um, what's the approach? Uh, and it's really four major areas um, you can bring into different things. So soon you get the traditional data center environment and an organization may be on different areas of this. We even internally, depending on what we have from our manufacturing are on different stages. Um, you know, doing compute virtualization, you know, moving from a, a heavyweight server landing to a virtualized uh, infrastructure, get, you know, gets greater efficiencies. Uh, be able to take advantage of more um, shared resources. That's not a new story. Uh, you know, the move to software-defined infrastructure, uh, automated orchestration using uh, not only, you know, virtualized compute, but also software-defined storage, um, you know, software-configurable network. Um, it really gave us greater agility, um, and that's what you saw. Um, you know, through, from that cost savings that we had before and agility deployment was really, you know, largely in this third phase. Um, now, what we have seen, interestingly enough, is the ability to go quickly uh, respond uh, to that and store data more specifically, you know, really gives us uh, more ability to drive new analytics and insights. Um, uh, we have an example um, where we've seen quite heavily, you know, the ability to store data, manage that data online, all right, in a uh, server-based uh, software-defined storage environment, um, we're able to then go drive analytics. Uh, one example that, that um, I'll just refer to is we have our security network logs. And having, you know, larger uh, storage frame around our network, you know, software-defined network, and then storing those logs online in our um, uh, server environment, we then drove new security analytics solutions around network traffic, around, you know, different capabilities, and just new, um, you know, sets of analytics from a, you know, security operations perspective. Similar um, kind of case studies around uh, sales and analytics, right? What are we doing for kind of predictive sales uh, management? And really driving that new set of focus that uh, a lot of organizations are pursuing around, you know, building on um, your uh, optimized data center infrastructure uh, and then doing new insights, uh, either manufacturing, um, sales, security, you know, number of case studies around analytics. Um, and so these are kind of the four major phases, traditional, compute, software-defined infrastructure, right, you know, spreading that out and then, you know, driving that out. Um, but where to start? Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say, hey, we've got an infrastructure approach with data center uh, consolidation. Um, you know, really, what's the hybrid cloud uh, model, um, you know, from that perspective? Um, certainly, kind of the two areas uh, come up uh, most frequently. Um, you know, start with really a cloud native approach and, and you know, taking your traditional infrastructure, uh, you know, optimizing some of the um, application components, connecting it back to your traditional 
uh, environment. Um, so you, you know, you may have a you know, an SAP environment or a heavyweight SQL uh, server, you know, traditional application, and then taking some of those new front end components, um, those web and app components, and connecting them back to your traditional infrastructures that may be virtualized uh, on the environment and pursuing kind of a cloud native um, perspective. Uh, that really makes, you know, a lot of sense where most people are pursuing that. Now, the reality there is uh, when you migrate that journey, not lifting and replacing that into an environment, um, you know, be able to modify uh, the things in place becomes an important kind of agility and execution strategy. Um, in fact, you know, most of the solutions that are running in most clouds are still running VMs, but they're running, it, they're pursuing a cloud journey such that they can get the agility and the benefits from this cloud native um, deployment experience model. Um, so start with cloud native. Um, don't, um, you know, uh, pursue it as I have to rewrite the entire app, right? It's really what are the components that you're um, extending and integrating. Um, and then also software-defined storage, the cost benefits of scaling out storage, taking advantage of, of capabilities, certainly just even moving um, your traditional um, volume stores over and then moving that from a, a block storage um, you know, model to an object storage model and taking advantage of some, some new cloud um, capabilities for doing that makes a, a ton of sense. Um, and then integrate you know, with the existing uh, sets of capabilities. Um, and so, you know, approach it from a, um, some people have called it kind of the hybrid hybrid, right? Because an application doesn't have to move holistically. Um, but just, you know, think about it as a stage deployment from an infrastructure and then how does this support um, your application environments as they progress up the, the flow. Um, and then certainly integrating some of those with external, um, you know, software, you know, uh, SaaS solutions where it makes sense. Uh, you know, like in our HR example, you know, certainly most of our employee data is internally, integrating that externally with, you know, single sign-on experience and then taking advantage of some of the cloud infrastructures for our own employee management talent systems and our external ones uh, becomes an important kind of consideration. Um, you know, uh, I am happy to say, you know, at least, you know, we've made the shift to supporting, uh, you know, cloud technologies, whether it's on-premise or public. Um, and so we do look at it, you know, quite holistically, you know, I, how do we run uh, and optimize, uh, you know, technology solutions from compute, uh, whether it's our, you know, standard Xeon platforms running, uh, you know, uh, in increased capabilities for app and VM isolation, what we're running with respect to you know, security uh, technologies and really putting you know, security at the hardware level, right? As we respond to uh, enabling flows, what are we doing from an ecosystem enablement uh, you know, and software perspective? Um, certainly one of the biggest areas that is, is being disrupted quite heavily is kind of the bottlenecks moving from a compute optimization perspective into storage and I.O. and network. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the things that we're seeing for, you know, in-memory analytics and being able to optimize, you know, storage platforms and be able to make sure we can, you know, really in, uh, respond to this growing set of data. Um, you know, certainly uh, what we've done from a, you know, um, you know, you know, 10 plus year research investment around uh, 3D cross porn and storage um, architectures and what we're doing for our Optane solutions becomes, you know, important new things to integrate with our, you know, cloud uh, solution providers, both in an open stack uh, capability as well as a, a public cloud. Um, and certainly, we're, I think we're just getting into the, you know, early phases of some of the network optimizations around, you know, policy based enforcements. How do we do, you know, from a traditional you know, firewall, you know, provisioning segment perspective and, and put, you know, really those firewall deep packet inspection things into, um, you know, this micro segmentation world of, you know, multiple apps that have to be kind of contained and wrap it around and, you know, many sets of uh, DMZs within a, a computer environment becomes important. So you look at, you know, kind of the network, um, you know, uh, virtualization and, and what's happening from a, um, you know, software optimization and a silicon optimization. Um, you know, so, you know, lots of platform architecture capabilities that we're looking at to, to try to enable some of those things. Um, so what are the key messages? Uh, certainly, uh, cloud technologies, when approached um, holistically, can accelerate some of these key business objectives around multi-platform, what's happening from a security. Um, you know, look at the, the characteristics and try to map that out. Um, you know, we've got some additional insights that you'll see around uh, mapping those out. We're certainly happy to, you know, help you um, in that journey, either, you know, through, you know, some um, our partner ecosystem or what we have in, in our other, uh, you know, field engagements. Um, 
but do focus both on the infrastructure and the apps, right? It's really a holistic digital transformation discussion. Um, there are absolutely certain applications that will run best on premise. Um, some that are optimized for public, um, and the future really is a mix between both. Um, and so, you know, engage, uh, you know, with um, some of the resources we have out on, on our IT center. Um, um, you know, we have some best practices with respect to what we've done internally. We try to drink our own champagne, as they say. You know, we're pursuing our own journey on that perspective. Um, and then we've got, you know, solution briefs and, and capabilities in our cloud builders where, you know, our partners have, have brought together uh, capabilities to enable uh, those, those solutions and, and case studies and brief, briefs that help you with that. Um, and then there's more resources. There's a, a link to um, kind of the white paper. If you just did a search on optimal workload on intel.com, it'll, it'll come up and it, it'll show you some of our more detailed research on, uh, details that says, hey, you know, in a, in a step uh, function, you know, what are some of the things that you can map out? Uh, there's some deep dive sessions around uh, other errors on flow. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, feel free to uh, send me a note if you have some follow on questions. And with that, I think we're at time. I'd be available for questions off to the side, I think, as we're run out of time. But um, what are we at from a time perspective? Good? OK. Thank you. Appreciate it.